Fedor Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky lived in the 1800s and he wrote about, well, a lot of novels and he wrote about God and he wrote about morals, death and the meaning of life and he wrote this one novel called The Possessed and it's not really possessed as we think of demon possession, it was people possessed with radical ideas of socialism and atheism and so on and so forth and those who re these possessed were those who re rejected God and were nihilists, socialists, rejected all moral norms. And it was interesting, in this book he had a character who wanted to do a study, a study on why more people did not kill themselves. It wasn't a study on why people killed themselves. But it was more, he wanted to study why more people didn't kill themselves. Their thinking was, well, there's no God, no judgment, no justice in this life, no hope of justice or anything in an afterlife. And you know, life was tough in Russia in the 1800s, so why live this miserable existence with no hope of any, anything being answered for rectitude or anything of anything being made up and so why go on with that why go on in fact it was interesting but a century later Frenchman Albert Camus began a book called the myth of Sisyphus with a series of essays and Camus wrote this in the 1940s and he began with the famous lines um there is only one truly important philosophical question and that is suicide. Judging whether or not life is worth living is tantamount to asking the fundamental question of philosophy. Okay, that's a bit, bit over the top, a bit depressing, but I, again, if you think through the logic of it, it's not, if you think it through to the end, it makes a certain amount of sense. But anyway, Dostoevsky wrote this famous novel, many consider it the greatest novel ever written. It's called The Brothers Karamazov. Big, thick. I mean, these Russians write big, big books. And The Brothers Karamazov, he had a scene, and Dostoevsky's the only writer I know who could have 200 pages of two guys sitting in a restaurant talking. 200 pages and holds you spellbound. And anyway, in this scene, there are two brothers. There's Ivan Karamaz Karamazov and Aloysia Karamazov. And Ivan represents skepticism, not necessarily atheism, but skepticism and so on, and just questioning and the old order. And Aloysia, his brother, is a monk, a Russian Orthodox monk. And he's more or less representing faith, belief in God, and so on. And it's just a discussion that goes on as 200 pages. And at one point, Ivan tells the, the story. He tells the story, whether it was true or not, it was probably based on something true, about some wealthy Russian landowner, and they had serfs. This was before the um, emancipation of the serfs. And apparently some little surf boy about eight years old threw a rock and it injured the paw It hurt the dog of the, uh, the landowner. And the, the landowner came out and saw his dog limping and wanted to know what happened to his dog. And they told him that the kid threw a rock and, and hit your dog, hit the dog. Well, according to the story, Ivan tells how the, the landowner had the child stripped naked, had his mother brought out told the child to run and set his dogs on him and tore the, the dogs tore the kid apart in front of his mother. Okay, that was the story Ivan told. And Ivan's point in this story, or the one about how the Turks and Bulgaria in some war would throw the ch Slavic children up in the air and catch them on the end of their bayonets. Or he told about the Russian parents who had locked their five-year-old daughter in a basement 
and left her down there and made her eat human excrement and on and on and on, left her down there for days on end in the cold. And his point in telling these stories and asking about these and others was to question, you know, ultimately, how ultimately these events, and of course we know others worse, could ever be justified, even at the end of an age when some divine harmony was to be restored, when all the insufferable questions are to be resolved, and when all God's ways, he said, are to be vindicated before men and before angels. I want to see with my own eyes, Ivan thundered, the hind lie down with the lion, and the victim rise up and embrace his murderer. I want to be there when everyone suddenly understands what it all has been for. But then there are the children, and what am I to do about them? This is a question I can't answer. For the hundredth time, I repeat, there are numbers of questions, but I've taken only the children, because in their case, what I mean is so unanswerably clear. Listen, if all must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony, what have the children to do with it? Please tell me. Close quote. You know, I tried this morning, I tried this morning if you were here to talk about the arguments for God's existence. Talked about the moral argument, talked about the cosmological argument, something had to start all this, something, and as I said, those who don't want to believe in an eternal existing God have argued that nothing, there are books out now written that nothing created the universe. And as I said, I think that's the most logical argument. If you don't want to believe in an eternal God created it, the only other thing that doesn't need an explanation is nothing. So, and I don't think that's a particularly good one. So you got the moral argument for the existence of God, the cosmological argument, You've got the argument from design and so forth. Talked about some of that. That's fine. I said, as I said, none of these arguments in and of themselves prove the existence of God. As, as, as absolutely prove, though maybe I've read too much philosophy, but I don't really have any idea what it means to prove anything, to be quite honest with you. But none of them prove the existence of God, however you understand proof. None of them by themselves, even all of them together, don't prove the existence of God. The arguments are good as far as they go, which isn't all the way, because if they went all the way, then everyone would believe in God, and obviously everyone doesn't. Instead, I believe that these positions, these arguments show how reasonable and logical evidence for faith is. Logical and reasonable, nothing more, nothing less. Okay? Whether you agree or not, it's one thing. I think logic and reason does work in favor of those who believe in God in contrast to those who don't. Yet, however logical the reason, however logical and reasonable the evidence, however strong of a theistic edifice for faith they form, either alone or together, what they don't do, the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, what they don't do either together or separately is they don't answer or even much less approach Ivan Karamazov's question, the children, what am I to do about them? However logical and reasonable those those proofs are no more logical and reasonable than the question of how could the God found at the end of the moral, the theological, and the cosmological argument be all loving and all powerful while evil exists? I mean, this is inevitably the most logical and reasonable question asked in a world where, where faith in God coexists with eight-year-old children being ripped apart by hunting dogs. 
As one philosopher put it, listen to this. If God is perfectly loving, said Scottish philosopher John Hick, if God is perfectly loving, he must wish to abolish evil. And if he is all-powerful, he must be able to abolish evil. But evil exists. Therefore, God cannot be both omnipotent and perfectly loving. Close quote. That's the gist of the argument. How could he be omnipotent, able to do everything, and perfectly loving, and evil exist? Now, that's a good question, except it misses a important point. You have to understand that omnipotence doesn't mean to do anything. Doesn't mean the ability to do what is logically impossible. And this is where I think people make a mistake. What do I mean? What do I mean? Can God do anything? Well, can can omnipotence create a triangle that has... Four sides? Can God create a triangle that has four sides to it? I'd say no, because the moment it has four sides, it's no longer a triangle. It's a logical impossibility, even for omnipotence. Can omnipotence create a circle with four right angle edges? Can omnipotence create a circle that's got four right angle edges in it? No, because the moment it has four right angle edges, it's no longer a circle. Can omnipotence make two plus two equal five? Say no, because the moment it's five, it's no longer two plus two. Now here's where I'm going. Can omnipotence create A love that is forced. Think about this for a minute. Can can God create a, a love that is forced? Can God force you to love Him or to love anyone else? I say no, because the moment that it's forced, the moment it's forced, it is no longer love. Just as a triangle, to be a triangle, must have three sides. Love, to be loved, by its very definition of love, must be freely given or it's not love at all. To force love is to destroy it. It's like a proton meeting an anti-proton. They annihilate each other. Love, by its very definition, definition as love, must be freely given or it's no longer love. Even God, the omnipotent almighty God, cannot create a love that is forced. Because the moment you force it, it's something other than love. Love to be loved has to be freely given or it's truly not love. Without freedom, Love is as impossible as a Euclidean plane without breadth or width. How can you have a plane, Euclidean plane, without breadth or width? It's the same way. Love to be love has to be, it has to be freely given or it's not love. God can create obedience without freedom. He can create law without freedom. He can create order without freedom. And he can create compliance without freedom, but not love. God can force every creature in the universe to worship him. If he wanted to, he could force everyone to worship him. He could force every creature in the universe to obey him. He could force every creature in the universe to fear him. But he cannot force a single creature in all his creation to love him. And here, and here's a crucial point 
upon which I believe the question, the foundations of understanding evil rests. The only way that humans, or really any creature in the cosmos, if you want to get down to it, the only way that humans or any creature in the cosmos could have, can love, is as if they, is as if they have moral freedom. Love is a moral concept. And to be able to love, you have to have moral freedom to freely love. And, and the only way humans could have that moral freedom is if they had the potential to make immoral choices. Freedom without the ability to choose wrong is really not true freedom. And you need true freedom to be able to love. Without that potential, without the option for immorality, without the option not to love, humans are not morally free. And if they're not morally free, they cannot love. Now, morality doesn't demand that wrong choices be made. I'm not saying that. It only demands that the potential, the potential to make them is there. Without that freedom, without moral freedom, without true freedom, you couldn't love. And love, because otherwise there would be no love. God could have forced everyone to worship him. He could have robots that, that follow him and obey him. Okay? And this is a crucial distinction. Without the possibility to do wrong, without the possibility, the potential to do wrong, then the whole idea of moral freedom, the freedom foundational for love, would be an illusion. Now I want to read you one text. And whether you take this literally or not, some do, some don't, but I want you to think about this. This is talking about Lucifer, an angel. If you know Christian theology, this idea of an angel who rebelled. Because I said, any creature, if God forced love of any creature, then it's not love. Love to be love has to be freely given. And this to me is one of the most amazing texts in the whole Bible. It's talking about this creature. And again, folks, with the size of the universe, the vastness of the universe, who's going to be so narrow and dogmatic to think that? This whole universe, the only place where there's life on earth is here. What a waste of space, literally, if you think about it. Talked about Lucifer, says, You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. First of all, that word for created is from a Hebrew root word, bara, which is used only in reference with God as the subject. There are a lot of different Hebrew, Hebrew words for making and creating and building and forming and so on. But this verb bara is used only with God as the subject. So it's saying to this creature from another part of the universe, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. So you've got, ideally here, you've got a perfect being, because it says you were perfect in your ways, created by a perfect God, what one would assume in a perfect environment, if you believe it was in heaven, and yet iniquity was found in this being. How could a perfect being created by a perfect God, you know, in a perfect environment, how could iniquity be found in such a being? Well, the only answer, I believe, is be because perfection in a cosmos where there's love, in a cosmos where God truly wants beings to love him, where God does not want to force, he doesn't want robots, where love is true love, it demanded the potential. It demanded the potential. It demanded moral freedom. 
because moral freedom is the only foundation you could have for there to be love. Okay, so let's say for a moment, let's say that you could accept where I've gone at this point. Love to be love has to be freely given. God cannot force any creature to love him. The moment he forces them, it's no longer love. Okay, so God really had no choice. Okay, I don't have a problem saying that. God had no choice. If he wanted beings to love him, he had to create them free. Okay, but that leads to the next question. Okay, why did God create free moral beings capable of love if he knew not only that they would have the potential for evil, which they had to have, but that they would eventually choose evil? Okay, see, in order for God to create moral beings, he had to create them free. In order to create beings who love him, he had to create them free. Logic demands that. But why did he have to create those beings to begin with? See, the point, freedom is a necessary prerequisite for moral loving beings. But what prerequisite required that these moral beings be created? I mean, I think the universe existed for a long time without humans, thank you. Okay, if you believe in being on the round for billions of years, you know, the universe. Okay, what, if anything, has made us a logical necessity in that our non-existence would entail a fundamental contradiction, therefore we had to be created? I can't think of anything. Nothing apparent. If we are not logically necessary beings then, in other words, if we didn't have to be created, and again, I just don't see any reason why we had to be created. I mean, I, maybe I'm missing something here, but we don't have to be here. We didn't have to be here. If we are not logically necessary beings, then an omniscient and an omnipotent and all-loving God created us without having to do so. He didn't have to create us, okay? Which must mean... First, he created us despite his foreknowledge that we would do evil, okay? There are just too many texts in the Bible which talk about God having foreknowledge and the plan of salvation being instituted before the foundation of the world. So, he created us knowing what we would do evil. But secondly, if he's an all-loving God, he created us knowing that if we did chose evil, if we did choose evil, because he's an all-loving God, ultimately he could bring a greater good out of what has happened. See, if knowing that fr the free beings he would create would choose evil, if knowing that, but God created those beings anyway, and if God is all-loving, it's an all-loving God, then he must have created those beings with the knowledge that despite their evil choices, he could ultimately bring out a greater good that reflects his love. Okay, so where have we been? Let's stop for a moment. Let's try to follow the logic here. God had no choice. If, we, if he wanted us to love us, he had to make us free. Okay? He had no choice. He had to make us free if he wanted us to love him. Okay? But he didn't, so he had no choice there. But he didn't have to create us. Again, I don't know of any reason why we have to be here. I don't know of anything in the Bible that says why we had to be created. Okay? He didn't have to create us. But God did so anyway. And he did so with the knowledge that human beings would fall and there'd be all this pain, all this suffering, all, this, all that goes on. But if he's an all-loving God, if he's an all-good God, an all-loving God, then we have to believe that he's ultimately going to bring out a greater good when this all is done. Okay? So that's where the logic has taken us. He had no choice. He had to create us free if we are to love. He didn't have to create us. He did it anyway, but he's all-loving. He's going to bring out a greater good. Okay. Fine, if you can follow my logic so far. But this leads to an even greater question. If I'm going to make these moves, 
which I think fairly valid. This brings us to which brings us to this point. Then we're confronted with what I consider the most difficult question of all in this whole scenario here. If there is a greater good, if all of God's ways are to be exonerated in a grand and final harmony that vindicates God and all that has happened here on earth, how can God justify working it out here? In the dirt, in human blood, sweat, and tears, in the children, why he sits enthroned up there in the glory of heaven. Can you see the point here? Whatever the profound questions, whatever the grand moral issues that are going to be resolved in this, some have called this great controversy between good and evil, how efficiently and permanently the promised answers will supposedly erase all doubts, iron out all absurdity, wipe away all tears, all that, that's fine. The question remains, why should an omnipotent, omniscient God be safely ensconced somewhere up in the cosmos? You know, you can say the angels feeding him grapes or whatever. He's up there where everything's fine and dandy. Know him knowing the beginning to the end while he watches us fools crawl on our helpless bellies here on earth, ignorant of the next moment, much less how it's all going to end. Why couldn't, whatever point this all-loving God wanted to make, why couldn't he have made it himself, rather than draw us miser human beings so miserably and inextricably drawn into this mess through no choice of our own? Can you see the point here? Again, one more time, let's look at this. God had no choice. If he wanted beings to love him, he had to create them free. He didn't have to create us. He did anyway. He did it knowing we were going to fall. But he's all loving, so he's going to bring a greater good out of it. Which is fine, he's going to bring a greater good out of it. He's up there in heaven, us poor schnooks are down here struggling and suffering with all the pain and suffering here. How fair is that? Okay, you're going to make your point, God. Reminded me there was once an American World War II general that named, oh, Blood and Guts Jones or something. And some infantryman said, yeah, some infantryman, man, once griped, yeah, oh, Blood and Guts. It's our blood and our guts, you know. And he's the general sitting safe in the headquarters somewhere. That's a valid question. And to find the answer, I want to go back again. Find an answer that has worked for me. I want to go back again to another ancient 18th century writer. A German, a person whose life somewhat overlapped with Dostoevsky's, though he was born about 20 years later and died about 20 years later as well. You probably heard the name Frederick Nietzsche. Like Dostoevsky, Nietzsche saw that our value system, our world was greatly changing, that the old ways were going out and new were coming in. Unlike Dostoevsky, though, he thought that this was good and he wanted to replace our morality with a new morality. And he's got this idea of the Ubermensch, the Superman, and you know, there's a whole cottage industry has been developed in hundred some years over what did Nietzsche's Obermann mean and all and on and on and on. I mean, there's every year there must be a dozen new books coming out about Frederick Nietzsche, which he kind of has an interesting life. The guy went insane. He, he went insane about in the last 11 years of his life. He just was in a totally catatonic and... Uh, didn't have much of a life in that sense, but you can't argue against his influence. Nietzsche was a hardcore atheist. He hated Christianity. He once wrote a book, The Antichrist, and he almost dubbed himself The Antichrist and so on. And he's blamed for a lot of views that he didn't hold, but that's another matter. Every time somebody, some kid, high school kid in America goes and takes a gun and shoots up a high school they blame Nietzsche for it and so on and you know they claim they said he was the philosopher for the Nazis he would have hated Hitler and on and on and on but he was definitely influential now it's kind of interesting though 
that of all the people, he wrote this book called Thus Spake, Thus Spake Zarathustra. And the irony is it was from Nietzsche that I found the answer that I believe to this question about evil and an all-loving God. Of all the irony we would get from all the people Nietzsche. Now I'm going to read you this one line. And when I read you this line, I'm going to tell you this line that I got from Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra answered the question for me. And I'm going to read you the line, and I'm going to read it, and you're going to go, huh? And then I'm going to read it again, and you're going to go, huh? And then I'll have to try to explain it. But when I read this line, it was suddenly, <clears throat> that's it. And again, the irony is to get it of all people, Nietzsche. Now let me read you the line. This is from Thus Spake Zarathustra. One short line. Quote, in the final analysis, one experiences only one's self. Close quote. Huh? In the final analysis, one experiences only one's self. Now think about this for a minute. Because I think he's 100% he's right. I don't know how anybody could argue with this. When we grieve with the grieving, when we weep with the weeping, and we suffer with the suffering, we experience only our own grief, only our own anguish, only our own pain, never anyone else's. We bleed our own blood. We spew out our own spit. We secrete our own sweat. Never another's, no matter how fused our flesh is. I don't care, you could have somebody standing right next to me, writhing in pain, moaning and groaning in pain, and I can grab hold of them. But I can't splice into their nerves. I can't somehow, like you do electrical wires, connect my nerves into theirs. I can't, I can't feel a prick of their pain, a spasm of their woe. Whether a mother holding a feverish infant to her breast, a husband holding a dying wife in his arms, we can't link into them. We can't feel anything of what they feel. Okay, no matter how loud, outrageous, or consuming, pain remains more private than thought. Thought can always be shared. Pain never can. Unlike the heart, the liver, or blood, suffering is non-transferable. What's yours is yours alone. When famine descended upon Ethiopia years ago and tons of flesh withered and faded back into the earth, they did so one quivering ounce at a time. However we die, however we suffer, whether alone or in bundles, corporate agony, collective pain doesn't exist. We're aisles of anguish unto ourselves. See, the numbers shock us. The numbers just blow our minds. Six million in the Holocaust, 20 million in, under Stalin, 30 million under Mao Zedong, hundreds of thousands dies in a flood, 100,000 die in a flood. The numbers overwhelm us, and how could this be? But all those numbers, in the end, in the end, that the numbers might freak us out, but all those people, every last one of them, every last one of them suffered only their own pain and never a speck more. Now this privatization of pain, this personalization of anguish, it's in, in a sense it's good because that means that no one suffers more, no one in this world has ever suffered more than one individual can suffer. Catch this point. Again, the numbers blow our minds. The numbers, ugh, you know, the numbers, what do you do with these numbers? And it, it's just so hard to understand but no one has suffered of all those numbers more than an individual can. No individual on this earth has ever suffered 
more than just one individual has ever suffered. Now, I don't want to, of course, I don't want to minimize the suffering of the individual. Please, okay? Oh, my goodness, what people go through. It's just, it's hard to understand. But we must remember that grief remains finite. Suffering remains finite. Hedged in by what's always as, quote, minuscule, but certainly as evanescent as the human. We no human being has ever known more suffering than their personal metabolism allows. No more pain than their own cells could ever carry. And again, this finitude is our defense, our physical boundaries, and it's our best protection. How fortunate for us that pain and suffering remains hedged in and limited by the inherent confines of our own individuality. I mean, it's hard enough bearing our own pain. Imagine carrying others as well. There is, though, there is, though, according to my understanding of the Bible, there is, though, in all of history, one exception to this rule. One exception in all of human history. One exception to this otherwise p pandemic personalization of pain. Only one time when this paradigm of individuated anguish shifted. And that is at the cross. As I said earlier, if you believe in this, you have to believe that at the cross, the creator of the universe, I said that already this morning, you know, try to wrap your mind around that. The creator of the universe, the one who upon all that was created rests, he shrank down into human flesh and was nailed to the cross, his life crushed out by all the pain and suffering of the world as a whole. It all fell on Jesus at once. Though we experience only our own fear, only our own anguish, only our own suffering, no one else's, at the cross, Jesus experienced everyone else's. The individual miseries of humanity were one by one added up and the gruesome sum fell on the Creator. See, there's a text in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, talking about Jesus on the cross. It's fascinating, you got an Old Testament text 800 years before. Talking about Jesus, and I'm reading, you know, the King James here is an awful translation. It's just a pathetically weak translation, I think, of Isaiah 53, 4. It says that he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Whose griefs and whose sorrows? Talking about Jesus. This was talking about the griefs and sorrows of the whole world. And that Hebrew word griefs there. The Hebrew word is really holy. And it really, the more literal translations mean sickness. Somebody who knows Hebrew would see that word alone out of context. That word holy. You would think sickness. He bore our sickness. Our griefs they translate. He carried our sorrows. Makavot. Probably the strongest word in the Hebrew language for pain and suffering, whether mental or physical. See, what that text is saying, he bore our, and we understand that as the world's. He bore the world's holy, the world's sickness. He carried our, the world's makavot, the world's sorrow, the world's suffering. All our sickness, all our suffering, the sorrows of the world, the things, see, that we know it only as individuals. So you are never going to feel another person's pain, no matter whatever you go through, no matter how tough your life is or it's going to be. And we're all in this pathetic mess together, aren't we? We all go through it. You know, we all, I buried my father. I'm, I'm 
a month ago. We all go through this, but we all know only our own. But according to this text, according to this text, it all fell on him, the creator at once. However much blood, sweat, and tears have been shed and spilled, no one has suffered more than an individual human being could suffer. They talk about the sum total of all the world's suffering, but that's really a false concept because it's never all added up. It's never all added up. It's just individuals except at the cross. No one has suffered more than an individual can. Our pain has never surpassed our finitude. No one ached more than he or she individually could withstand. I think the moment the threshold was crossed, death cracks it all off and it ends. So in contrast, far from God remaining safely ensconced somewhere in the sky, at the cross, all the evils of the world and all the doleful results fell honed in on him at once. From all the, it's, it's, it's a hard concept to grasp. But what are we going to do? That's the text. It's a hard enough concept to grasp the creator coming down in human flesh. And then him hanging on a cross, bearing it all in and of himself. But all the pain, all the suffering of the whole world that we know only as individuals was all amassed at once, and it was enough even to kill him. So where have we been? Let's go back and look at this. God had no choice. If he wanted beings to love him, he had to create them free. Okay? Love to be loved has to be free. He didn't have to create us, but he did anyway. And because he's all-knowing, he knew what was going to happen. He knew that sin and evil would come. But because he's all loving, he allowed it to happen anyway because ultimately he's going to bring a greater good out of it. But that leads to the final question. Okay, he's going to bring a greater good out of it. That's great and that's wonderful, God. You're going to work it all out and you're going to prove how great and so on you are. But we're down here and you're working it all out in us while you're up there in heaven. How fair is that he should be in heaven while we suffer and die here as this good is all worked out? And the only answer I know, the best answer I have, is the cross. At the cross, God suffered more than any of us because he bore in himself corporately what we know only as individuals. God suffered more, infinitely more, than any of us ever could. Now, let me be fair. This doesn't fully answer the question of Ivan, Ivan's question, the children, what shall I do about them? Nothing does. I don't think anything can. I, in fact, I have a sermon that I talk, talk I give sometime called The Inexplicable Unexplained. And I don't think evil can be explained because the moment you explain it, the moment you start to rationalize it, is the moment you start to justify it. And I don't think evil could ever be justified. But I think it's just ultimately the foundation of it comes from this concept of true moral freedom. I think that's the only even beginning to get an explanation for how could evil ever arise is if freedom, moral freedom, is truly moral freedom. Some guy once made an argument, well, why couldn't God have created beings who were morally free, who only chose the good? A philosopher made that argument. Why couldn't he have created beings who only, who are free, Morally free, but only chose the good. But I think that's a very, very narrow, limited view of freedom. 
It's like saying somebody, I'm alright, somebody's in jail. They lock them in a jail cell, 100 feet by 100 feet by 100 feet. And said, Joe Blow is perfectly free. He's perfectly free to go anywhere he wants to in that cell. He's perfectly free. He could walk this way. He could walk that way. He could climb the wall if he wants. He's totally free. It's a very narrow view of freedom. No, I don't think anything can only ex ever justify evil or ever totally explain it. But the cross, it doesn't fully answer Ivan's questions. Ivan's question. It just helps me personally live with, an an live with it unanswered, which for now is good enough. I'd say no, with the cross. And the idea that's where God suffered more. The freedom he gave us, knowing what we would do, Knowing, though, okay, I want these beings to love me and I want them free. Because that's the only way they could love me. This is what it would cost. That helps me live with those questions unanswered, at least for now. Okay. Any questions?